Grace and peace be to each of you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus, who is indeed the Christ, the Anointed One of God, and let us pray. Good and gracious Heavenly Father, thank you for the day and thank you for your word. It is indeed an amazing word, which is a living word, and so every time we come to it, every time we ponder it, there's something new in it for us to, for us to see. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the insight into the word that we are looking at today from Revelation 14 that you have given me. Thank you for all those answered prayers, Holy Spirit. I appreciate your help. Lord, I pray that you would anoint my tongue to declare this word this morning and anoint every ear and heart and mind and spirit that hears and receives it to receive it in faith. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would grow us up in this faith. We pray, O oh Lord, you would prepare us for what's coming. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, last week, we heard the stern warnings of, uh, the stern words of warning given by an angel of the Lord to the people of the earth. Those words were, if anyone worships the beast and its image and receives a mark on his forehead or upon his hand, he also will drink of the wine of the anger of God, having been mixed undiluted in the cup of his wrath. And he will be tormented in fire and brimstone before the holy angels and before the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment goes up to ages of ages. And those worshiping the beast and its image have no rest day and night. And if anyone receives the mark of its name. Interestingly, and this is an aside, it's not on my paper, is that this week I learned that the chip that they plan to put you know, in, a, in the people who were going to receive this thing, in the hand or in the forehead, those two places are have been chosen because the electrical impulses that are in the hand and in the forehead are the strongest. And so having the mark placed there, those particular places are actually going to power the chip because that much power is there. Okay, so that's kind of an interesting to think about. It's like, huh. So that's why they will be placed in the, in the right hand or in the forehead is because that's where the electrical charge is the greatest in the human body. So right there, right there. So, interestingly. So, anyway, so not get the mark of the peace, beast. Don't get it, don't get it, don't get it. It's a bad thing. For those who receive the mark of the beast, even though they may have spent a lifetime professing Jesus Christ, getting the mark of the beast is to tell Jesus, tell God, that buying and selling is more important than God is. That's what it is. Getting the mark of the beast. Now listen to this. This is insight that the Lord gave me uh, in part this week. Getting the mark of the beast will be similar to... Esau selling his birthright to Jacob. Esau sold his birthright to Jacob for a bowl of lentil soup. He was hungry, and so he said, what good is my birthright if I'm dead? So he sold his birthright to his brother Jacob simply because he was hungry. Afterward, his tears could not buy back for him what he had sold. So let's not sell the birthright we have received in Christ Jesus, our Lord and Savior, just to keep buying and selling in a world which God has already condemned and will destroy. It's better for us to go without whatever it might cost us, food, clothing, shelter, than lose the birthright that we have received as sons and daughters of God through Jesus' sacrifice. Now, Prior to our hearing the warning about not taking the mark of the beast, John recorded that he saw an angel flying mid-heaven and proclaiming God's glad tidings. This angel was also speaking in a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. 
and worship the one having made heaven and earth and sea and springs of water. Then John saw another angel who followed the first beast saying, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great who has given all the Gentiles to drink of the wine of the passion of her immorality. Let's understand this. The way Revelation 14, beginning at verse 6, is written is to let us know that God's eternal glad tidings must be preached, Babylon the Great must fall, and the mark of the beast must be put into, into implemented in the earth uh, and throughout the earth before the harvest of the earth takes place. So now we can move on to verse 14. Now we're going to count, encounter three more angels and the Son of Man, and the harvest of the earth. Verse 14 reads, And I looked, this is John, and I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud is sitting one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. This is none other than Jesus. The golden crown upon his head is not a diadem. It's not a royal diadem. It is a stephanon. And a stephanon was a wreath about the head. Now this is a golden wreath about the head. And it was generally given as a prize in the public games or as a symbol of honor. Why would Jesus be wearing a stephanon instead of a diadem? Well, because he is the victor over sin, over death, over the power of the devil. And so his victory enabled him to take back the authority over the earth which Adam and Eve had given away in the Garden of Eden. The fact that Jesus is wearing a Stephanos as he sits in this white cloud is a reminder to us, particularly the devil, that he, Jesus, is Lord of all the earth. Now what perplexed me at first as I started pondering this particular text was the fact that Jesus was sitting on this white cloud. He's sitting on this white cloud, and he's got a sickle in his hand. But he's sitting, and that seems kind of odd. You know, the wonderful thing about pondering the Word of God is when you ponder it, the Holy Spirit's quick to just give you insight into that Word, and the Holy Spirit did. Well, as I pondered this scene that John saw, I thought how sitting is oftentimes a position of rest or inactivity. Well, we certainly know that Jesus has not been inactive since he rose from the dead and ascended to the Father. I mean, he is the one interceding for the saints before the Father, before the throne. So we know he's not inactive with that. But, he, so he is interceding for the saints, and he is doing whatever else the Father instructs him to do, and that's the key. The key is, Jesus is sitting on the cloud with the sickle in his hand, because he is waiting for the Father to tell him that it's harvest time. He's ready. He's just waiting for the green light go ahead. Remember, Jesus did not do anything. He did not say anything unless he saw his Father doing what the Father then wanted him to do, or he heard whatever the Father then wanted him to say. He was not a free agent. He was totally dependent upon seeing what the Father was doing before he did anything. He was totally dependent upon hearing what the Father said before he said anything. So Jesus is waiting. He has a sickle in his hand because that's the tool he is going to need to accomplish the next word that he knows he's going to hear from the Father. He knows that the next thing he's going to hear is the command to harvest. Why does he know that the next thing is going to be a command to harvest? Because the glad tidings have gone out. We've heard that in the first verses of chapter 14. The reminder to everyone on the earth to worship God who made heaven and the earth and the sea and the springs of water, that has been spoken. Battle on the great, that wicked place has fallen, and the warning not to receive the mark of the beast has been given. So, in verse 15, we read, 
And another angel came out of the temple, crying in a loud voice to the one sitting on the cloud, Put forth your sickle and reap, because the hour to reap has come, because the harvest of the earth has ripened. Now the fact that this angel, this angel, a messenger of God, comes out of the temple crying in a loud voice to the one sitting on the cloud, put forth your sickle and reap because the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth has ripened means that the time had come for the earth to be harvested. The, the father would not have sent out his angel to declare this word unless it was time for the earth to be harvested. But of course, I wonder, why did God send an angel? You know, why doesn't he in a booming voice go, it's time, thrust in your sickle, son. <laughs> he didn't do that. I don't know why he didn't do that. But angels, we know, are God's messengers. And so the Father sends one of his angels to declare this word. It was harvest time. And verse 16 says, And the one sitting upon the cloud put forth his sickle upon the earth, and the earth was harvested. It was like, poof, it's done. That was easy. It was effortless. Jesus simply put forth his sickle upon the earth, and the earth harvested. We're given a visual image, which shows us that our Lord is going to be the one who will bring in the final harvest from out of the earth. What Jesus is harvesting here with his sickle, he is not harvesting the wicked. He's harvesting the righteous. Now, this isn't immediately clear from the text. It will become clear as we read verses 17 through 20. But before I read those verses, here is one more thing about Jesus' actions to note. And it's this. This is what I want to really zero in at this moment. When Jesus got the word from the angel that came out of the temple, the word from his father, and was told, put forth your sickle and reap, because the hour to reap has come because the harvest of the earth has ripened. He immediately thrust his sickle into the earth and the earth was harvested. What we need to notice from this for ourselves is this. Jesus is showing us the proper response to anything that the Father tells us to do. When the Father gives us a word to do something, that is the time to act. It is not the time to pray about whatever we've been told, ponder about what we've been told, or question what we've been told. It's the time to do exactly what we've been told to do. That's the time when we hear the word. That's the time. So now let's read verses 17 to 20. And another angel came out of the temple in heaven. He also having a sharp sickle. And another angel, having authority over the fire, came out of the altar, and he called in a loud cry to the one having the sharp sickle, saying, Put forth your sharp sickle, and gather the clusters from the vine of the earth, because its grapes have fully ripened. And the angel put forth his sickle to the earth, and gathered the vine of the earth, and cast them into the great winepress of the wrath of God. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed out of the wine press as high as the bridles of the horses to the distance of 1,600 stadia. So have you been keeping count? In Revelation 14, 6 to 13, Jesus, um, John records the activity of three angels. And from Revelation 14, 14 to 20, John records the actions of another three angels. Now we also hear in this last section, there are two harvests we need to note. Those who are going to belong to God through Jesus, they are going to be harvested. And those who do not belong to God through Jesus are going to be harvested as well. The first group, the final harvest, is harvested by Jesus. The second group is harvested by an angel. Now, we're not really told anything, given much description, about what happens to the first group. I mean, we know what happens to the first group, because we've got so much in the Bible that points us to what's going to happen. We know that everybody who belongs to, Jesus, belongs to God through his Son, what's going to happen to us is wonderful. Okay? So everybody belonging to God through Jesus Christ is headed for an eternity filled with joy and endless love. 
We are, however, given graphic detail for what will happen to the second group. The second group is gathered as grapes from a grapevine. And these were cast into the great wine press of the wrath of God. I don't know, nobody wants to be in that group. Okay, nobody really wants to be in that group, even if they think they want to be in that group. They don't really want to be in that group. And I believe that that's why the description is so graphic. God has always been into full disclosure. He always tells the truth. No one will be able to say that they did not know what they would receive by not belonging to God. Okay? I mean, at the very beginning, when Adam and Eve were in the garden, before they sinned, God told them, on the day that you eat of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, you will die. And they did. They died spiritually first, and then they died physically before a day, one of God's days, a thousand years, had passed. So a day, either one, physically, within a thousand years, they die. Spiritually, they died immediately. So God is in the full disclosure. He doesn't want anybody to say, I didn't know. All right? And the wine press was trodden outside the city. The fact that the wine press was located outside the city, and this would be the city of Jerusalem, and the grapes trodden there is significant. Listen to the words from Revelation 22, beginning at verse 14. I want to start there so that you can hear the context. Blessed are those who do his, meaning God's commands, that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city of Jerusalem. But outside are dogs. Now, they're not talking literal dogs. Dogs, in this case, is a, a, a symbol of workers of evil. Okay, so outside are dogs, workers of evil, and sorcerers and sexually immoral and murderers and idolaters, and whoever loves and practices a lie. So outside means outside of God's kingdom. Not partaking in God's rest, and not enjoying God's love for eternity. Being outside is a very, very bad thing. And the wine press was trodden outside the city, and blood flowed out of the wine press as high as the bridles of the horses to a distance of 1,600 stadia, or 183 miles, or basically the distance it is from here to Buda, Texas. All right? It's like, whew, that's a lot of blood flowing. It's an awful picture to imagine. But it gives us the idea of how much wickedness fills the earth when the time comes for the wicked to be harvested. The fact of the matter is this. No one needs to be a part of this group that's going to be cast into the wine press of God's wrath. Jesus suffered and died and rose again for all people. There wasn't a single person whose sins were not covered in Jesus' sacrifice. So we need to keep praying for the lost and those whom God would describe as the wicked to turn from their wicked ways and live. Because that's what God wants. And here's a passage from Ezekiel 18. This is God's take on the wicked turning from their wicked ways. Ezekiel writing for the Lord says, But if a wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is lawful and right. He shall surely live. He shall not die. None of the transgressions which he has committed shall be remembered against him. Because of the righteousness which he has done, he shall live. Do I have pleasure, any pleasure at all, that the wicked should die, says the Lord God, and not that he should turn from his ways and live? Again, when a wicked man turns away from the wickedness which he committed and does what is lawful and right, he preserves himself alive because he considers and turns away from all the transgressions which he committed. He shall surely live. He shall not die. And so we need to be praying for the wicked 
You know, we need to be praying that people who don't presently know God or presently understand their need for God would come to know God because everybody needs him. I'd like to share with you one slide today before we end because I want to share with you how awesome our God is. Um, on July 4th, there was a 6.4 earthquake in California. And things really started rattling. Okay? The very next day, a 7.1 occurred. And then lots of other... Oh, let me just show you. These are quakes and aftershocks and whatnots. Okay? Lots and lots and lots. And, you know, that just really isn't all of them because there have been over 1,500. Okay? You know, aftershocks and so forth after the quakes have hit. And there have been probably 4,000 reports, uh, I felt it reports, okay? Uh, so that people said, this is what I felt, and whatever, whatever, whatever. There have been YouTube uh, videos on it, all the way into Phoenix, Arizona, about swimming pools sloshing back and forth and that sort of thing. So I didn't get a picture of the I felt it. But over here would be Los Angeles. And I was wondering when I was looking at my map, where's Los Angeles? Because it should be kind of close to this, and I couldn't see it. Well, it was covered with I felt it reports. Okay? And so, but what is our awesome God is this. A couple of things. Nobody got killed. There was damage, yes. There are about 14 homes that burned to the ground. But nobody was killed in a 7.1 and a 6.4. Nobody. Now, of course, rumors are flying around. Is the big one next? Okay? Everybody's going, is the big one next? Well, uh, let me show you that again. The thing that is upsetting or to, to people who are looking at earthquakes is that these earthquakes are clustered in one area. Most of the time, a big earthquake like the 7.1, 6.4, and 7.1, most of the time, something like that, particularly where it was located, it would, the energy from the earthquake would spread eastward. So there should have been 4.0s, 5.0s in Middle America, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas, okay? There should have been, but it's staying right here. And so the concern of the geologists and so forth is since the energy appears to be staying right here, there is a great likelihood for an even bigger one to hit now within the next day or so. Okay, so that, that's concerning to them. What I find amazing about our God, and I know that we've wondered when the big one was going to hit with California for a long time. Uh, what I found so wonderful about our God, so merciful about our God, A, nobody was killed. But the other thing is, is that if, and this is an if, I understand it's an if, if an even bigger earthquake happens, these people have had warning. And they have had a chance to now, for the last couple of days, consider their life and get their spiritual life in order if that's what is needed for them. And that's what I'm hoping that these people have been doing, is been you know, taking stock of them and understanding how quickly things can come to an end. God didn't just say, here's the big one. He could have, but God is merciful. He does not want any one person to be lost. And I think that what's happening in California is evidence of that. I really do. Because he could have sent the big one without warning. He did not. 
He wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. And so, you know, we don't know, obviously, what's going to happen. We know that the, the you know, earthquake forecasters are thinking a bigger one is going to come because that energy has not spread out. But I thank God for his mercy and for his love that he is showing the people of California because he didn't have to give warning. Because what has God been doing for a couple thousand years now? Warning people that the end is near. You know, California has had floods and fires and whatnots, you know. He didn't have to warn because he's been warning. But look, he keeps warning and warning and warning and warning and warning because he loves all people. So let's keep praying for everybody to turn to Jesus Christ. This passage from Ezekiel chapter 18 has a flip side of it to it. You know, yes, it says that if the wicked turn from their wicked ways, they shall live. The flip side of that is, is if the righteous turn from their righteousness and become wicked, all of their righteous deeds will be forgotten. Yeah, oops. So it's a t double-edged thing here. The righteous have got to stay the course. The wicked need to turn for their wicked ways to Jesus Christ and live. But the righteous have got to stay the course too. So I pray whoever belongs to either one of those groups, I pray they'll do what is necessary in order to spend eternity with God. Because that's the place to be and nowhere else. Amen.